Well, we are outside City Hall because we are talking to Mayor Carolyn Goodman today about the ordinance that passed last week on homelessness. That's today on Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt, Cashman Equipment, and additional supporting sponsors. Earlier this month, the Las Vegas City Council voted 5-2 to two in favor of a controversial encampment ordinance bill. Starting February 1st, anyone camping within specific areas in downtown Las Vegas when beds are available, local shelters, could be fined or jailed. Las Vegas Mayor Goodman and several downtown businesses support the ordinance, saying chronic homelessness has become a public health and safety issue. However, civil rights groups are protesting the ordinance, arguing the city cannot arrest people out of homelessness. To discuss the ordinance and its possible effects, we are joined by Las Vegas Mayor Carolyn Goodman. Mayor Goodman, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you for being uh, with me and having this opportunity to talk about our wonderful community. You bet. And and what we're specifically talking about is the homeless issue that we have here in downtown Las Vegas. They're part of Vegas. our wonderful community. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, last week we had an ordinance that, that passed. It was voted through. And the first question I want to ask you is just why now for this ordinance? Why is this so important to go through right now for the city? You know, I was asleep. I happened to live with a person who was mayor for 12 years, um, and this is my ninth year, so 20 years plus. And I woke up in the middle of the night knowing the issues and constant conversation we have about the challenged population that is becoming stronger and bigger each year, and how hard my husband tried to um, bring everybody in for help and training and housing for everything, and nobody would take advantage of it. And so as we were getting comments from street people and from people who have businesses and tourists and residents coming downtown, how filthy it was, the smell, um, the safety issues. I woke up in the middle of the night after one of these conversations and I thought, that's it. It's time to do something. And of course, we've been doing something now for the past five, six, seven years with the Corridor of Hope and certainly our wonderful partners in the nonprofits. My goodness, when I think of the amount of time, energy, effort, money, and success that they have had, but how much they compete for the almighty dollar to continue to do and serve the homeless population. So it just came to me that I really, this was enough. We have so many meetings. There have been so many conversations. And here it's been 20 years. And really to say that we're doing something, that we're really helping, it became very clear we aren't. Let's, let's skip ahead. Let's move to February 2020 when the ordinance goes into effect. And let's just say I'm homeless and I have an encampment in one of the designated areas that the ordinance is covering. Um, and there are beds available. What is the process going to be? Well, first of all, you know that Metro has taken this amount of time to help train their officers. We have our more teams, and we're adding more to the more teams. They're part of our Marshall contingent. Um, they're so kind and good, and they're out there talking to the homeless. But what will happen on the 20th, um, at 2020, in February 1st, uh, they'll go into the encampments and they'll say, you know, we have beds available. Wouldn't you like to get back and come in? We we'll, can get you cleaned up, give you a full meal, give you a place to stay, but help you get back a job and get the dignity back to your life. So we'd like you to come on in and we'll take you down to the courtyard or to one of the other facilities that we have and get you started on getting your life back. Now, if I decline that, is that when we're looking at potential misdemeanor charges or like yes, how many levels of this? Are, yeah. Misdemeanor. Yeah. You know, there's rumor out there about a felony and I'll never get my life back. No, it's a misdemeanor. The reality is if we don't have some type of alternative, everything in life is about choice and the ability you have to make a choice. Certainly, um, 
it's some component of our homeless population. We have those who are severely mentally ill and they are not in a position to make a choice. Do I want to do this that's good for me or do I just don't want to do anything? And so our hope is to get all the people that are in a position to make a good choice to give them back their lives and help them do it through counseling and nutrition and sanitation is get them there. The part of this homeless population that is either so severely drug alcohol addicted that when we even try to send them home, the families say, nope, they've already cleaned us out, they've stolen from us, whatever, all they care about is their drugs. That's another component that's not in a position to make a good choice right now. So we have the severely mentally ill, and then we have the um, drug alcohol deeply addicted. The rest of our homeless population is absolutely right there, potential to get back into life, become a productive member of our community, and we so desperately want to help them. There's been conversation, there have been meetings, there have been committees, and what do we have to show for it? And we like to learn from other places, and we have been to Los Angeles and San Diego and San Francisco and Portland and Seattle, and all these different cities that are in our same district circuit court. Um, area, the ninth, the ninth. And they're overwhelmed with a population that the sanitation's critical and just a, a real center for developing really very debilitating disease problems for us. Mm -hmm. To say nothing of the safety for the human being himself or the surrounding areas. So what happens is those who refuse treatment or refuse to come in then will be taken and incarcerated. And for those who are drug alcohol addicted, you read so often, if you've done the data and the studies, you know it's drying out. And the ability to be able to get to a point where I can make a wise decision once again in life, not influenced by drugs. So this sort of is the implementation that will hopefully get them started on it. And let's talk more about that implementation. Let's talk about the shelters themselves. Um, yes. A lot of these resources and a lot of what we're trying to do with the corridor of hope and what we're trying to do with the courtyard itself yes. is not only be a shelter, but also be a place where we have the resources they need, substance yes. abuse, mental health yes. care, uh, alignment with potential job and employment and things like that. Right. Um, is our system ready? to take on the extra capacity here once this ordinance? Absolutely not, that's the whole thing and that's what's so magnificent about this. It has brought about the conversation that you can't sweep this under the rug. For those who work in our wonderful social services and all those who donate time, now is the time. This is a conversation that hopefully will result with everything from the very tip top all the way down to the grassroots where we're working to work with the people who are caught in this terrible, terrible lifestyle. And to me, one of the biggest things right at the top is forget the federal government who should be providing some type of help financially for us to help those who really are incapable of taking care of themselves that have severe mental illness. So they can be safe, they can be in a sanitary location with food and counseling and the, the medications that they need to at least have a stable existence. But beyond that, we are one of four states in the entire country that has a legislature that meets every other year. That's ridiculous. We get about 30% of our assembly that is new every other year. And so something happens, there's no funding coming down. We haven't received any help over the years of any magnitude to do anything. And that's what the city has done. We have finally said, we are going to do something. Everybody else is going to have more meetings and more conversations. There will be more uh, binders from the meetings. And then the next group will come in, newly elected or newly appointed or newly hired, and will throw out the old binder because they don't like what they were doing. And so this will just keep kicking the ball down the road. Yeah, and let's, let's talk more about the funding specifically at the state level. You did a lot. You were very active in the 80th legislative session. AB 73, which at one time had, I believe, $20 million of funding, it was gutted. And that just became more of another work group. Um, 
Yeah. For one thing, back to the ordinance itself. Is the ordinance something that is then potentially, or at least optimistically, a short-term solution? No, 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 no. No. It's a tool. It is a tool to say, we are sick and tired of nothing happening. We need the funds, we demand help, and it's about time to have conversations and really move this along, but not a conversation that is unproductive. We have had those for the 20 years that Oscar and I have been mayor thus far, and it's time to see results, see action. And I understand from many on our more teams that a lot of those who are part of the homeless population don't want to come in. Well, we, the tourist capital of the year, of the, of, excuse me, of the world, for heaven's sakes, we depend on tourism. They're not going to keep coming here if every other day, every other moment, wherever they are, they're crawling over encampments or we have the aroma and the, the disease potential that's out there. It would kill our whole economy. And when you go to Union Square or you go down to Skid Row in Los Angeles, you're not going to stay there very long. That is not a place that we want to be, and we're learning from that. But the time has come. Fish or cut bait, now. Now, and as the ordinance being a tool, do you think when we're looking maybe forward at the 81st legislative session, we might actually see some funding and some... That's activity. two years away. Two years away, and correct. I, what, I mean, it's all this conversation of uh, transitional housing. For certain parts of the population, they're ready for it. Do you know how long it takes to identify a piece of property, get the liens off that property that's abandoned, go ahead and plan what you're gonna put on it, and then build it? I've heard five years. I wish, I wish, and we're needing it now. So we can have more conversations, and those who are so bright to go ahead and make it all happen, let's wait and have more meetings. Let's get together, let's all Southern Nevada get together and talk about this issue. We are doing something because we're responsible for the city. And all I can tell you is the city, everywhere I go, people come up and say, thank you. We want to help now that there's a plan. Now granted, I have said there's flaws in it because we're just start really starting it. We have a, a courtyard. What we're trying to do and what we're doing here in the city, in the center, is say, here's a model. We would love to see Catholic charities give us their full budget for the year and everything they're doing. Uh, let's say Shade Tree and Hand and uh, the Shannon West that's out there on, uh, out in the county. Let's go ahead and create a solid model that can be replicated in North Las Vegas, in the Southwest, in Henderson. Boulder City has an issue, but it's not too, too bad an issue right now. And that th this thing that we're creating here can be improved upon, fixed, molded to be a better place when they do it somewhere else. And let's talk about some of the concerns, and you were touching upon one there, that we could potentially have courtyards in different cities. One of the complaints or one of the concerns of this, of this ordinance is that there could be migration outside of what the designated areas are to other cities or other areas of Isn't the Isn't that appalling? They're worried it's gonna to come to their city or their community. I find that absolutely rep reprehensible. And I think, where's the humanitarian spirit? Where is what we're trying to do? And they don't want any overflow, any of these encampments. Oh, shame. The, the, other, the other complaint here is the, uh, the human rights and the constitutional rights aspect of this. Um, the Ninth District Court that you mentioned before has had several lawsuits and has made certain decisions in other cities related to this. Uh, first off, do you see litigation coming related to things that we've seen in some other cities like Boise and Seattle? You know, I have to assure you, uh, while I have two sons who are lawyers and a husband who, who is a lawyer, I am not a lawyer. So I wouldn't venture into that area without the assurance that our city attorney's office, 
who the ones who actually have helped us work on this ordinance um, would be the ones with whom you would speak. But we know this is Las Vegas and uh, we count on tourism and we count on people wanting to live here and investing here to pay the taxes which help us support those who aren't so successful and provide the food and help support the nonprofits. If we don't have success here economically, we don't have anything. Yeah. Let, let's talk about the opposition then maybe in, a, in, a, in different terms. Let's talk about the community-based side of this. So um, organizations like the ACLU and Battleborn Progress have been very active. How about active. let's talk about Metro Chamber of Commerce? How about yeah. let's talk about law enforcement? How about let's talk about church groups that are so benevolent and kind and understand, yes, we have to help. Yes, we need a model. Yes, we want to get on board with you, the Mayor's Faith Initiative. What can we do? How can we do it? We have so many Many of our pastors, reverends, priests, rabbis that want to see something concrete come about out of this. Yeah, let's talk about both of them, both the opposition and those that are for it together. We've talked about collaboration, right? We talk about people are talking, but things aren't actually getting done. Mayor, what do we need to do to actually activate and mobilize everybody? We, do, we need the money. We need the legislature. The legislature needs to meet every year. In fact, they should have an office. They should meet up there one year down here the other year, have an office in both parts of the uh, state, and let us get in there and talk about how are we going to find the funding. But we also need to be about this model that I keep talking about. We've got all these conversations going and nobody comes up with any way to get the money. How do you pay for it? To me, that is the biggest thing. Everything needs funding. Do you think beyond state, are, are there ways that the federal government can kick in? I've heard potentially. I would, but look at, oh, oh, look at the federal government right now. We have all these people running for in the candidacy that had the audacity to come up complain and talk about how bad this is. Did they ever call and call anybody in the city to find out what the ordinance was? Maybe it was going to be a solution, but they went out and bashed it, which is what seems to be happening. Everything's being bashed. We couldn't even get money from the legislature. So we're, we, here in the city, have taken from Peter to pay Paul, taken from one fund and put it in another to help fund the courtyard, to help fund the corridor of hope, and to respond to the needs right now. So let, let's talk more about those long-term solutions then. As you mentioned, the ordinance is more before transitional housing, but we're talking about a whole continuum of care strategy here that goes to transitional housing and then potentially permanent affordable housing. Right. There are other states around us that have been very successful, New Mexico and Utah specifically, been able to with what they call housing first models, right? Where they're putting a lot of their money into affordable housing and they're finding that's cheaper than actually taking care of homeless. Again, we're talking about funding, but do you think that is the model but that wait we one need to second. be following? Wait one second, when you talk about housing first, here's the spectrum of what is the population out in the encampments, the homeless. This part, newly into um, homelessness or caught, we were number one in the country in foreclosure. They're ready for the transitional housing opportunity. Every single piece of the population is a one-on-one, -on -one, one person at a time. What are the issue? Who's the person? What are the needs? So the, those caught in the foreclosure, they can go into housing first. But those who've been on the street for a long time or are coming out of some really big disability, they're not ready to go into even an apartment because they don't know how to take care of an apartment. And how are they then going to be able to feed themselves? How are they going to get to the market to buy the food? I think the entire issue, we've been working on this so long. We know all the negatives of why. But this piece of our homeless population, this piece is the piece that we're working on by this concentration. Those who are doing things they shouldn't be doing, more harm to themselves, probably, but also harm to all of us. This is the population we can get into housing. But this next group, they don't know how to live in a house, take care of an apartment. So we have to work very hard and then have 
a one by one follow up, each person at a time. How are you doing, John? How is it going? Do you need anything today? Uh, do you want to have your counselor come chat with you today so you feel better? How's your medication? If you run out of your medic medication, where are you shopping? Where are you getting your food? Those are the next section that can go into housing. But this piece over here, Housing first, no way, they'll destroy the entire place. They're not ready for transitional housing. And we saw it when we were working with the cabinet people during the administration, the Obama administration. How is the city then going to define success related to specifically this ordinance? The city of Las Vegas is not looking at success. We are looking at each poor person caught in this horrible, horrible situation of homelessness. And we are trying one step at a time to make life for them bearable and then good, and then also make sure that we are taking care of everyone else so they will understand they need to send in charitable dollars to help us, to help help, and to help hand, and to help Shade Tree, and to help Three Square, and to help Opportunity Village. And we need our state government finally to step to the plate and put money there. We have a facility in Gene, Nevada. It's a perfect, perfect place for those who have severe mental, mental issues. They need a safe place. They need somebody to care for them and feed them and medicate them and give them a quality of life they may never return fully to society. And for the drug addict who is out there just losing his life or her life out there, they don't need to be on our streets preventing our tourists from coming here and people who live in the residencies being fearful of their lives because somebody needs another fix and that they're breaking into their houses or accosting them at the grocery store or on the street going right up in their face and doing horrible things and saying, no, this is about it's success. Hmm. There's no nirvana. We're just trying. We are trying so hard, but at least we are trying and we're not having meetings and more round tables and more of these booklets made of this is what the last group did. We need action and this city of Las Vegas is putting its mouth right in the right spot. And we're going to try and we're going to have failures, but we're trying. We are trying as hard as we can, and when I'm out there on the street, whether in the grocery store, the doctor's office, anywhere, people are coming up and saying, finally, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for making the effort. We're with you. And the negatives, I haven't heard of one. I have not had one email. We've probably had a few phone calls, but we saw that at City Council. I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed for the people who were so rude and so unable to listen or care instead of saying, how can we help? And that, that's, let's, if we could have one more final question on that, is those individuals that were opposed to this and were very vocal, what would be your charge to them now that this has I, passed? Kath, I think her name was Leslie Turner. She was so gracious and respectful and articulate, and she was talking about the need and my thought was, wonderful. I, in fact, I think I even said, I want to get your name or address so I can contact you. My first request to her would have been, how can we help you work with the homeless in the encampments to get these ideas you're talking about that we should be meeting to have? Everything starts with me, every human being, and what I can do today to make life better for somebody else. And so if all the people in the homeless would stop thinking, me, I, my, me, I, my, aren't I, it's somebody else's fault, he did it, she did it, that institution didn't give me. We all work hard, and we're put on this earth, earth to make life better, and that's the charge. So all the homeless that were there so rude and screaming and yelling and clicking and clapping, that's not tolerable. That isn't, that's just downright stay where you are in a homeless lifestyle because you're not helping and you need to start with yourself and then reach out and make it productive and i believe there are an awful lot of people that are caught in this 
homeless abyss that really can get back to a great life and have family around them again and be contributors. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure, Mayor thank Goodman. You. We really appreciate it. Because you can tell I'm very passionate about this and just know we have to do better. You got it. And I think, I think the theme that we're taking away here is we all need to do better, right? This yes. is a collaborative, Bless you. collaborative issue. Without question. Yeah. And we know we're put on this earth to do something for somebody else once you get your own act together. And so some of us all the time struggle with our own acts, but the reality is it, is, it does feel good to put a hand out to somebody else and then have them put their hand in yours that they're ready to go forward. Right, right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us this week on Nevada Week. Now, for more resources that we discussed on the show, please visit our website at vegaspbs.org slash Nevada week. You can also find us on social media at Nevada Week.